Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today, we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today, we're going to be looking at Helen Galloway McNichol or Helen McNichol's painting here, Girl with a Parasol from 1913. I love this painting. I love this artist. I've been meaning to do an artwork on her since... I was originally going to do this for our, well, not this painting, but another one of hers for New Year's, or New Year's Day, three, two years ago, three years ago. Finally getting a chance to do, to, to, um, to do this. I'm still going to reserve that painting we're going to do for New Year's, uh, for New Year's one of these days. Uh, but uh, she's an incredible painter, um, argue, well... Uh, certainly probably in the uh, of all the impressionist canadian painters probably in the top two or three uh, of all time uh, there weren't that many but uh, or at least who who are as well known today as they were at the time uh, she's she's a fantastic artist and really had she lived longer i'm sure she would be far 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 better known than she is today so let's get into it uh, let's we got some painting to do if you're watching the video for the first time please like subscribe hit the notification bell so you know when upcoming videos are taking place take a photograph of the artwork you're you've been making or you've made whether it's this painting by McNichol or somebody else or something entirely from your own uh, imagination which is I think we're, we're all aspiring to do um, then upload it to the Facebook group. Uh, once a month, I go through there and give some free feedback. So if you want to participate in that, that's how you do that. The link to the Facebook groups in the description below, as well as links to ways you can donate to support the channel. So if you want to leave 25 cents, a dollar, $500 via PayPal, the link is below for that. You can use the super chat, although YouTube takes 40%, whatever you donate. So PayPal or sending an e-transfer are probably your best bets, uh, ensuring that I receive the majority of whatever you donate. Uh, my email is on the Facebook group and on my website. All those links are below. Um, people have sent things directly to the university I teach at. If you That's okay, but just let me know you're going to do that because I don't always check my mailbox. Sometimes it goes four or five months before that happens because most of this communication now is all through email. Anyway, let's uh, look at the plan for today. We're going to get some color, or sorry, we're going to get the image onto the canvas. Then we're going to stain it with some color. Then we're going to talk about who Helen McNichol was. Um, we might do an underpainting for this painting. Then we're going to go back, ground, foreground, background, foreground, and ideally start wrapping up in, say, two and a half hours. So if I'm done by in three hours, I think that would be good. Um, there's a sort of impression that impressionism is really fast paintings and we should be able to get done very quickly. I think it may be faster because often they're painting outside, but I think um, there's still there's still plenty of stuff to keep us busy for this on this painting. So our first step here is to get the image onto the canvas. So let me show you how I like to do that. Um, one of the ways is you can just draw this image, but you can also use the link to the Dropbox folder in the description below, and you'll see at the very top, these are our resources for our most basic episodes, like supply guide, color temperature, color wheel. The next, uh, I don't know, 60 sort of folders here um, are for more uh, easier paintings on the whole, I would say. Some of them are a little more complex than others. Uh, and this is today's artwork right in here. But I just also want to show you that there are, there's like another 160 folders here, some of which have five, eight paintings in there. Um, and these are all probably a little bit more complex paintings. So if you find today's painting, you know, is pushes your, challenges you enough, well, then maybe stick to this uh, row. If you feel like, meh, I feel like I, I can do something a little more complex, then go further down, right? <laughs> um, and then so in this folder, you're going to see that currently 
there are three files. There are more because I want to do, There's a, I've already done the outlines for three other uh, Helen McNichol paintings. So eventually they're going to end up in here as well. But I'm just going to hold out on posting all of those until we get closer to those days. So you have right here, there's the original file, uh, the original painting, and then there's the outlines that I've done. One's in JPEG and one's in a PDF format. I'll just show you. There's the original and then there's the uh, the tracing I did on my iPad Pro using the Procreate app. I just drew over top of all the little lines in there. Okay, so let's get this image onto the canvas. So the first thing here is I've got a 9 by 12 sized canvas board or canvas panel. And you might also notice, what is all this toothpaste goop on there well they come pre-wrapped in plastic i ordered these off of amazon um, and you can use the ones from the dollar store I, I do find these ones a little bit better and there is a link to this in the description below as well um, i take it out of the plastic and then i apply a second coat of acrylic gesso white gesso and then i let it dry overnight and then i sand it and right now hmm that is just super smooth. It has a very small amount of texture, but I'm telling you, it's I personally find it so much easier to paint on a smoother surface. Uh, why they don't, you know, ship them already nice and smooth and prepped with a couple of layers of gesso? Probably because not everybody likes a smoother surface. And, you know, once it's smooth, it's really hard to it would be basically impossible to make it rough again um, so but I would say probably I'd say probably 95% of people like them a little bit smooth great business idea out there anybody who's who might want to uh, uh, offer a really like double gessoed smooth sanded canvases anyway what we're going to use is some carbon transfer paper, although technically this is graphite transfer paper. The link for this is in the description below. Uh, you can get, I, I think the, the link is for 100 sheets of this for $12. I just ordered some just yesterday because I'm slowly, slowly running out of them. You can see that I've used it many, many times. And I'm also using the shiny side, putting that face down. Because depending on what your usage for these are, you could get like 20 paintings out of one of these sheets, right? Okay, so I'm going to go over top of these lines. Maybe not every single one of them, however. So I just want really the basic form because everything's going to get covered with paint. Probably going to come back to this umbrella and add, go over that with a ruler when I'm actually painting it. So most of the grass, I'm just going to leave untouched here. I mean, maybe I'll put a few of these where they're overlapping with her, her body.
Okay, let, oh, her shoes. Let's, don't forget those. I think I forgot, I just want to check. Um, just looking, there is a little bit of a, I've obviously missed her shoulder right here. little tidy up here. Hi, there's Kathy and Christine in the chat. Kathy says, I'd love to do a faster one. <laughs> you mean you don't like doing the full eight hour paintings? <laughs> Um, okay, let's, uh, let's move on to the next step here. So our next step is to apply a little bit of color over top of this. And one of the ways that I like to do this is I like to put a bit of a warm yellow over top of the painting. Now I'll just sort of talk a little bit about what we're about to do. I like to use what we call a split primary palette and that means we take our primary quote unquote primary colors yellow red and blue and we split them in half because every color has a temperature it's either warm or cool yes there are colors that are very close that are like room temperature but there's it's easier to paint when we have when we take colors that are a little bit further away we can always mix the two blues together to get that color in the middle the color in the middle, I guess, is, you know, probably your cobalt blue, for instance. But we can take our two blues, mix them together, and then we got a cobalt. So instead, we split them, and then we get a fuller, more saturated range of all the other colors, like our greens and uh, purples, particularly. Um, and then we're also going to mix our own black, even though I do have a black tube of paint, but it's, I've hardly ever used it over the years. So the, this is the brand of paint that I'm using. I'm not sponsored or paid by them, not given any free materials, nothing. I go out and buy it just like you. And I really like this brand because it's been proven. I've done, you know, approaching 300 painting episodes. And some of those episodes I've done three, four or five paintings in one episode. So there's lots of artwork that's been tried and tested with this particular uh, brand. Um, you can also use golden. This is a little bit higher grade of paint that's three times the price. And you're going to get probably the same results, maybe just a little bit more saturated color. Um, you can use Liquitex. From, um, you can use Windsor & Newton. You can use Artist Loft from Michael's Art Supplies. You can use Buzz, Peebo, although Peebo I, I bought for some of my in-person classes. And I have noticed that their cool blue has got a little bit too much white mixed in here, which makes it impossible to make our black. So it might be getting the same treatment here as um, our museum color from Toronto. Mm -mm -mm, don't recommend them. But you can use Chroma Color from made here in Vancouver, Nova Color made on the spot in Los Angeles, Fevacryl and Holbein, and yeah, Peebo are back here. So uh, those all work to various different degrees. Obviously, the less expensive paint you're going to be using, 
probably the cheaper uh, pigments and the more filler you're going to find in there and, and probably the, the more likely it is you're going to find it really difficult to mix that black. Um, so I'm just going to put some... Uh, I've, so traditionally for this Empre Matura, artists would mix a kind of a rusty red color, a bit of a brown. And But this isn't a brown, this is a warm yellow. Why am I not doing what all the great artists in the past have done? Well, I have done the brown, and I usually find that by the end of the painting, they look very similar. Not the same, but very similar. And it's far as I'm concerned, similar enough that this is just gets the painting started nice and quickly. Um, the purpose of the Imprematura is, there's well, there's like a dozen different reasons, but one of which I think is just, it obliterates that scary white surface. Instead of having to kind of um, have this, yell, this uh, <laughs> white surface taunting us, now we've got this yellow surface taunting us <laughs> um, but uh, it it just sort of gets rid of the what am I gonna do first what's the first color oh no oh, I don't know where to start well here we are paints already on the canvas now we can continue another thing I like particularly for like beginner painters is now we've got this yellow and it might encourage you to, to really try to fill it up um, as opposed to just leaving a whole bunch of blank spaces uh, because there's that yellow poking through. Not that there's anything wrong with yellow, but it might kind of help you see a little bit more clearly what needs to be painted. Now, I should say that the, the Impressionist painters... Um, were the first ones to really experiment with, uh, with not doing this technique, with, with just painting directly onto a white uh, canvas. So, you know, if you were to skip this step, um, you, you would be, you know, you, you depend, well, we haven't looked, I haven't looked too closely at the painting yet, but it wouldn't be entirely wrong or historically inaccurate to do so. I just noticed that the vast majority of, you know, my students at the university I teach at come in and have never heard of this step before because, you know, a lot of people online don't teach you how to do it. Bob Ross doesn't teach you how to do it. Nothing against Bob Ross. I did a whole two episodes on Bob Ross. Uh, but uh, it's, this is kind of an older, more traditional technique and, um, you know, again, I, I think probably the, the Impressionists probably really started that whole idea of questioning this process to begin with. I'm just going to put all these paints on here while I'm... Oops. Put my blue in the wrong place. Put my blue in the wrong place. white okay okay so I just squeezed these out and then I just realized uh, do I want to use maybe you know what I'm gonna use some of this <laughs> if I can get the tube open I've just got so much paint hanging around that I might just use some of a different brand here just to get some of this stuff acrylic paint will last if quite a while if it's in a nice sealed tube or jar but once if air gets into it not only might it it dry out but it can sometimes mold can form in there right because it's a water-based paint and where there's water you know uh, bacteria will grow I mean Hey, that's why we're all here. If there wasn't water on our planet, we wouldn't be here. 
Um, so bacteria will also form in your paint if it's left unattended for a period of time. Just got to somehow a little finger. So, let's go to our next step here. Ah, okay, so let's talk about who today's artist uh, was and why she's still so important and why we've decided to focus on her today. So, Helen Galloway McNichol or Helen McNichol, as she's probably most known to people, is really one of the, the greatest Impressionist painters in Canadian history. And as I mentioned off the top, had she lived longer, she would have, um, she would be arguably, probably along with uh, um, Emily Carr, one of the most famous Canadian uh, female artists, at least, of all time. Um, and so it's super unfortunate that she passed away at the young age of 35. So she was born in 1879 and dies in 1915. And so um, uh, she's born into a fairly affluent family. Her, in, her family originally comes from England. Uh, her father was, was um, a railway man and had uh, worked for the railways in England. And so he's sent to Canada to help develop the, the rail system here. And, you know, he's, he's like, a, you know, because of his connections, uh, the family is, is, you know, one of the most powerful families in Toronto. And so that allows her to basically do whatever she wants as a young woman at that particular time in history when you know, as we've talked about over and over, all, pretty much every single episode we've done focusing on a female artist, we end up talking about all of the the barriers that they must overcome uh, in just to to do what they love doing. You know, for Helen McNichol, because of the wealth of her family, many of those doors that were otherwise closed to other women are, were open to her. Uh, because having a really powerful father like she did, um, you know, either made people uh, afraid of, of upsetting him and getting on the bad side of maybe other powerful people, or they wanted to curry favor with him, right? Uh, I'm not saying that they're, they're, her work in and of itself and her personality um, didn't uh, open doors as well, but... You know, we've looked at a number of other artists, great female artists who've who've been incredibly skilled and talented, who were you know basically run out of uh, um, and and forced to uh, totally abandon their their dreams of of making art. Unfortunately, right? It's I mean I'm glad we're living in a a world today where that is unfortunately not you know. Um, a totally a thing of the past, but far, far less common than it once was. Um, anyway, um, let me see. Uh, her father also had some training as an artist and liked to sketch. You know, he would go on these these trips to to visit sites of where rail uh, lines were to eventually be laid. And one of the things he would do is he would do some sketching and drawing, both as part of his job, but also just for pleasure. And so he um, gave, imparted that love of art to his daughter and her six other siblings. She had three sisters and three brothers, so kind of a, a big family. And, you know, as the, the, the letters attest, uh, the family, everyone got along, or so we think, and uh, um, and everyone 
also was was given freedom to explore their interests as well. So um, in terms of a childhood, for the most part, uh, she came from a very loving family. Her mother was also into poetry and also painted um, pottery. So, you know, when she, Helen Galloway, or Helen, <laughs> when Helen Galloway McNichol also started to show interest in art, I think her parents were actually quite excited for her. And unlike other women who, uh, you know, might have been asked to give up their um, uh, their passion for art uh, in order to fulfill more um, common gender roles as they were defined back then, she was in encouraged to continue. Now, having said that, she did, as, uh, as a young girl at the age of two, was diagnosed with scarlet fever. And scarlet fever, while it still exists today, um, is uh, is nowhere near the problem that it was back in the day. Scarlet fever at one point around the turn of the last century was the leading cause of death amongst children. So, you know, the 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 outlook for a child diagnosed with scarlet fever back in the day was not good. So I imagine the fact that she, and I don't know if her siblings also caught uh, this disease, which really has no known cure. There's no vaccine even to this day, um, but there is treatments that are available today that weren't available back then. Um, but, you know, just thinking off the top of my head, I imagine the fact that she had this very, very close um, encounter with death at a very young age. I'm sure her parents might have been just extra um, doting or uh, supportive, encouraging, um, you know, I don't know what the exact word is. They might have just been wanting to take extra care of her and and wanting you know there's just just the, the the thought that they almost lost her is like we really have to nurture this young child as best as possible because she came so close to slipping away from us um so the the result of that of her um having scarlet fever is it cost caused her severe hearing loss so she basically spent learned uh, throughout the rest of her life to read lips and to be very observant um, of other people while they were talking and 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 gesticulating when they're talking in order to infer the meaning that they might have and you know when, as soon as you start thinking about that you think like oh this young girl who has a, a severe hearing deficit has to use her eyes to really look carefully to suss out what's really going on in a situation is it really that surprising that that young woman becomes one of the great canadian artists of all time probably not right because that incredible power of observation that she sort of inadvertently gained from this near-death experience basically turned into a superpower that she then employs to make some of what I think are some of the greatest paintings in certainly Canadian history, but really in, in human history. Um, there is some mention here that, you know, she attended like the Protestant Deaf Mutes uh, Institution, uh, but some of it's not recorded in the census. You know, I wonder if part of that has to do with like her family's connections and maybe there was, you know, still to this day, a stigma about various different kinds of challenges uh, people might have. The family might have been like, let's just, can we keep that out of the official records? You know, we don't want to have that be the overriding um, uh, something that defines her for the rest of her life. Um, so in 1902, so this would be at the age of 20, 21 roughly, she travels from her home in Toronto to London, England to study at the Slade School of Fine Arts. 
the Slade School of Fine Arts to this day is one of the, the great art schools in all of England, um, along with uh, the Royal Academy, the Royal College, Goldsmiths, and I'm sure there's one more that just escapes me that someone will write to me about how dare I um, forget. But she, so at this young age, she, she travels across the ocean by boat where she then um, studies under Philip Wilson Steer, who was, you know, a, a really great um, British painter, landscape painter, seascape painter. And uh, he was also very encouraging of her. She also meets her, quote-unquote, lifelong partner, Dorothea Sharp. And that the, the relationship between these two women, I'm not, is, I'm not entirely sure if that was just a purely platonic friendship uh, or there was maybe some romantic um, uh, uh, um, feelings between them, but neither of them uh, ever married or had children, and they spent most of their time traveling together. There's lots of examples of paintings that they made side by side. So, which is not uncommon. There, there's lots of examples throughout art history, uh, especially of the Impressionist painters who worked together in, in uh, maybe not in teams, but would often go on painting expeditions together because that was a kind of a big new thing at the time. You have to remember that for the majority of human uh, existence, and uh, of and certainly Western art history, artists would make art in a studio, right? They would sketch, draw, mix paint inside of a room that may or may not have ever had windows, and most of that art it has, you know, very little to do with direct observation of nature. What happens to that enables Impressionism and Impressionist painters to go outside is the invention of, or the, of pre-mixed paint that comes packaged in tubes that you can go to an art supply store and buy. And you get these tubes, you throw them in your backpack, and now you can go paint anywhere you want. You're not confined to a room where you're grinding up your own pigments and mixing them together, and they you know once they they are exposed to the to the air and oxygen they start to dry and you've got to use them quickly impressionists painters were super lucky they're on the, the kind of the cutting edge of technology at the time you know it's just like today artists now have iPads and various different kinds of digital tools that have transformed you know certainly illustration and graphic design and just to a lesser extent fine art you know prepackaged paint was a absolutely revolutionary, evolutionary step forward. So um, while she's there, she uh, she studies at a few different places. She also st studies at St. Ives in Cornwall um, and the Julius Olson School of Landscape and Marine Painting uh, with Algernon Talmadge. <laughs> um, in 1906, she comes back to Canada and she studies at the Art Association of Montreal. And I think what is really pretty surprising about the way that the the school was run at the time was that it was a very open and uh, progressive school that allowed women to participate to to paint live nude models. Throughout Europe, that was a big no-no. Women were allowed eventually, I mean, first of all, they, there were often separate schools for men and women. And then when they were integrated, women were allowed to go to the school, but they weren't allowed to, to attend certain classes, um, particularly the figure drawing classes. So they were allowed to draw portraits of mostly other women, but weren't allowed to go into the rooms and observe and, and work from the nude models, most of whom were nude women, of course, right? Um, but this school in Montreal was, you know, very open-minded and allowed women to to paint nude models, which, you know, for some people is like, well, what's the big deal? I mean, there's just nude people. Well, 
that's one of the, the traditional ways that artists have learned to paint is by working from the human body. Because as you might have known, noticed from many of the classes that we've done, painting a figure is pretty tricky. Mixing skin colors from paint is pretty tricky. And when you're forced to paint another person, that person can only hold a pose for half an hour, two, three hours, maybe at tops, and, and certainly they're taking breaks, but it forces you to paint quickly because there's a level of urgency to that situation that is not present when you're painting a bowl of fruit or, you know, or a, a house, maybe a landscape to a certain extent, but if you're painting uh, a person and that person, you know, has things they got to do before and after, you know, they're going to get up and move and they might not be back ever again, or they might not be able to take that same pose. So you've got to be like, you got to be on it. You got to, you got to really be confident and, and you got to learn how to, to, to do all those really basic things like mixing paint and applying paint and, and sketching out the, the form as quickly as possible. So that, you know, again, it might seem like not a big deal, but that I think was a game changer for Helen McNichol because gaining that experience, you know, even though it's painting people and she did paint a lot of people also helped her paint landscapes because she's then has that ability to express herself very quickly. Um, one of her big t teach, one of her more, most important teachers is William Brimmer. And he was, um, I think we've probably talked about him a few times. He's also another important, a very important Canadian art teacher and artist. Probably maybe only superseded by William Cruikshank, who was the teacher for many of the group of seven painters, another very important group of Canadian artists that we've done, I don't know, a dozen or, or more episodes uh, on as uh, we've looked at all all. 10 members of the group of seven <laughs> um, because the, 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 the ranks changed over the years. Um, also, another thing that Bremner um, uh, was, he not only invited women and allowed women to, to, to take his classes, uh, often alongside the men, but he was also really, really supportive of women um, being professional exhibiting artists as well. You know, there, there was sort of like this attitude back in the day that, yeah, women can go to art school. Sure. Yeah, let's let them go to art school. Let them, let them have fantasies of doing all of these things that the guys get to do. But really, we all know what's going to happen. We're going to marry them off, and then they're going to be preoccupied raising the kids and... And then maybe when they're retired, we'll we'll give them a cheap set of paints and let them, uh, you know, have a little bit of a Sunday hobby, right? Brimner, on the other hand, he was like, no, women should be able to um, make art and exhibit art alongside the men, and and if that's what they want to do with their lives, and they don't want to be mothers, and uh, then they should have that option, and. So, so he was also very encouraging of her and also helped open doors for her. So you can see that she's, in many ways, uh, Helen McNichol had, um, you know, she was very, very fortunate to have a pathway in front of her that the vast majority of women, certainly before her and during her time and even for many, many decades after her did not have. So yes, she had this really unfortunate um, disease that caused her great difficulties as a child. Uh, although I think it probably, you know, inadvertently gave her a, a heads up on maybe everyone else, that incredible power of observation. She also maybe had a few less hurdles to overcome than so many other women of her time. Um, let me see. So there's, um, uh, 
as I said, I, I mentioned earlier, earlier that Dorothea Sharp was her really close, lifelong friend and partner. Uh, they, they nicknamed each other Nellie and Dolly, and they were often seen together constantly making artwork together. They often posed for each other, so there's artwork paintings of one another, um, because what a better way to practice when you've got another artist who can sit still uh, for long periods of time because they know what it's how hard it is, and so um, that was also super helpful because, as additionally, because... Uh, Helen uh, McNichol had this hearing challenge, you know, having another person that is kind of with you all the time to help you deal with maybe, you know, you're in a restaurant or you're um, in a train station and it's really loud, having someone who, who can help in that situation and probably McNichol being able to read lips might have also been very helpful for Dorothea Sharp as well, right? Um, now, sort of there's the, the the as we get close to the the end of of the story here what's super tragic is world war 1 breaks out in europe in 1914 and you know both of these women are living in england at the time and are um uh, they've made all sorts of uh, relationships with people in the art world there and many of their friends that most they've really uh, helen mcnichol has spent you know the off and on the majority of her you know 20s and early 30s in in London and besides you know studying for a time in Montreal she's um uh she she when world war one breaks out she wants to stay in Europe and um uh, she's she's she doesn't because you know there's a lot of Canadians are leaving going back to Canada um, and her father is like, I want you back here. There's a war out there, and that's a, this is a pretty gruesome war, so let's get back as quickly as possible. She did not want to leave, but ultimately, I guess her father had his way and brought her home. The tragedy is, is that not too soon after she returns back to Canada... Oh, sorry, she, so she died in Dorset. Oh yeah, I oh, know. So I thought she died in Canada, but sorry. So, um, so she did return to Canada, but I guess she comes back to England here. Now I'm just reading this. Either way, uh, so Helen McNichol dies at the age of 35 in 1915, not because of anything related to the war, but because of her diabetes that she had developed. And, you know, it's just super tragic that this young woman who... Um, was really just just beginning. You know, she's in her early 30s, mid 30s, and has is making a lot of really great work. Suddenly passes away, and you know we can, we'll take a look at some of her her art here, and you just think like really she's only been really making art at the height of her powers until uh, for maybe five six years before she passes away and you know just as i'm thinking about this it reminds me a lot about the story of, of another great tom of another great canadian artist tom thompson who also passed away just about five years after he really began to devote himself to art you know probably the most famous artist of all time who died you know unexpectedly really after just getting started would be vincent van gogh who also, you know, had maybe four or five years of, of focused art making before he passes away. I think these are just amazing paintings. Um, here's today's painting, obviously. Um, you know, some of these remind me a lot of uh, a New York artist, Alex Katz, that we've looked at. Um, we did a paint a whole episode on him probably two, almost three years ago. Uh, and, you know, these are just absolutely gorgeous paintings. I had a really hard time deciding which one to do, which is why I've, I've got four of them queued up for us. Um, some of them, you know, might appear maybe easier than others. Like this one, this would be, you know, probably take me about four or five hours to do. It's deceptively complex. Um, I love these little quick sketches that she's doing. 
right? You know, great artists like Helen McNichol are able to communicate very, very efficiently, right? They they are able to to describe the the complex world around them in just of uh, in the in in the fewest amount of brush strokes possible like this is gorgeous look at this interior of the house and then this little ray of afternoon light coming in like that is so bold for her to do something like that and I, you know you just wonder to yourself how did like what a what a radical composition like i can't think of another painting until i think of maybe some of matisse's paintings with windows that are, are more abstract than this but um that's beautiful right painting children obviously because women weren't allowed uh, to um to paint history paintings which is generally considered or at least was considered to be like the pinnacle of what an artist could do and of course only men are allowed to do that uh, she would have been sort of relegated to landscapes and portraiture mostly painting other women including her partner Dorothea Sharp um, but you know for for what many might consider to be like a, a ridiculous um, restriction for her was something that she was like okay well if that's all I'm gonna do then I'm just gonna be the best at it so and she certainly <laughs> I mean uh, let's take a look at if see there's a really excellent, um, I guess, digital book that you can see here from the uh, Art Canada Institute. This is where I found a lot of information on a lot of the Canadian artists we've looked at. And so this there there are you know many pages here. You can download the entire PDF, which is about 60 pages long, or you can go through the the the. Um, uh, the, the website here All right there's a number of other pieces so so for instance here this is um, this is a painting by her partner Dorothea Sharp uh, in a very very similar composition All right so you can see that they may have painted the same painting together at the same day or they, because they might have had um, the same model, or uh, maybe they took turns posing for each other. You know, this image of uh, of a woman with a parasol was was something that had been certainly established by uh, probably the most famous impressionist painter of all time, Claude Monet. There is a painting, a, a woman with a parasol that I do want to do. It's on the list of, there's about another 50 paintings ahead of it. But um, I, why would it have been such a common motif? Well, probably for one reason is you have these Impressionist painters who are going outside to paint. So they're painting landscapes and they're thinking, well, wouldn't it be nice if I included a figure in the landscape? Because putting a person into a landscape gives us some idea of scale, right? It helps break out, break up the monotony of maybe the of a big field of flowers. Not that a field of flowers is monotonous, but just from a visual standpoint, it can kind of give some an anchor to a painting. And then if you're going to ask someone to pose for you for an hour or more, it would be nice if they had an umbrella to stand underneath for hours and hours and hours under the hot sun. Or because you're painting outside, maybe that hot sun turns into a rainstorm. And so being able to kind of uh, have some shelter would have been uh, welcome. I did just want to mention here, this, um, this painting was auctioned off by Hevel Fine Art in... What year was this? Hmm. There is... So it was, it was auctioned off on November 19th, 2008. It's in a private collection here in Vancouver. 
Um, but the original estimates were $100,000 to $150,000 Canadian, um, which makes it one of the most expensive paintings of hers that is, has come up for auction. And I, I, I don't, I haven't been able to find out what it actually sold for, but it wouldn't have surprised me if it either met that high estimate or exceeded it. And her work, I'm sure, is, you know, that was, you know, 20, well, not 20, but 15 years ago. It wouldn't surprise me if, if that amount would easily double by now, for sure. So if you're, if you've got a little bit of extra money kicking around, you may want to think about investing in the art of Helen McNichol. And just lastly, before we move on, a couple things here is that there is a big exhibition opening in Toronto in just, uh, I guess, a month from now. Uh, Mary Cassatt and Helen McNichol, Impressionists Between Worlds. The AGO, or the Art Gallery of Ontario, is is really the, the, the best art museum in Toronto, which is the largest city here in Canada, and arguably rivals the National Gallery of Art in Ottawa, a few, well, five hours drive away. Um, and... You know, I, I, the, the main, I guess maybe the main difference between the National Gallery in, uh, in, in Ottawa and the AGO is the AGO does, has maybe a little bit less, you know, often features art by, by artists that, that aren't uh, Canadian. The National Gallery has a great collection of old master paintings from Europe and uh, China, Japan, etc. But really their mandate is collecting Canadian artists. The AGO has maybe a little bit more broader collection, a broader scope, um, and also has probably the best collection of, of Canadian art from this particular era. They also, I mean, they really have the best uh, collection of uh, group of seven paintings anyway. So if you're in the Toronto area over the course of this summer, 2023, you should go check this out. Mary Cassatt being probably the greatest American Impressionist painter and Helen McNichol being arguably the greatest Canadian Impressionist painter. Mary Cassatt was one of only a few um, women that exhibited with the Impressionists. Uh, we have looked at the other women that were a part of that uh, Impressionist group as well. And I, I, she's also the, uh, Mary Cassatt was also the only American at, in, of any gender to exhibit with the impressionists so that's you know if you're if you're into impressionism and you can't get to the musee d'orsay in paris you got to go check this show out in toronto this summer and i bet you it's going to travel i wonder if there's anything it doesn't say but it it wouldn't surprise me if this showed up somewhere um, oh yeah i was looking to say oh no I was going to say Philadelphia, but it wouldn't surprise me if the Philadelphia Museum of Art traveled this show as well, because um, Mary Cassatt has certain connections to Philly. Okay, I think I want to get started with our painting here. So, our next step is to do our underpainting. If we want to do an underpainting. So there's lots of different ways that people use this term underpainting. Some will combine the imprematura into an underpainting. And often that happens if you're if you haven't done any drawing uh, with a pencil or charcoal or anything, you might just take your paintbrush with some of that rusty red color as I mentioned before and literally just sort of kind of roughly paint in your composition. Another way of, of talking about underpainting would be to kind of block in all of your, your shapes, right? Your, your basic areas of color. That's, and then another way, the way that I tend to look at it these days is, especially for the, these classes, is maybe painting certain kinds of like facial features, hands, fingers, details that might get consumed or covered up with other paint. Um, so let's, I think maybe before I make my decision as to whether I want to do this or not, let's take a look at her painting in depth here and just see if we can spot maybe how she went about making this painting. 
Now, the first thing I'm, I see up here is this to me looks like the either so this dark so we have blue obviously but the the what we see underneath is the texture of the canvas and that canvas is either um a linen what we, what we call today like a belgian linen let me see do i have oh i got a i got a painting with some linen on it here give me one second just across the Okay, so this is a painting of mine. Gosh, I didn't even sign this. This is from 2002 or something. Um, but anyway, uh, so this here is what we call Belgian linen, as opposed to uh, canvas. Do I have, a, should have done this all at once. I have one within arm's reach. Well, this is, here's a canvas bag. I'm sure this is made out of the same kind of canvas you would paint on. So here you have your canvas, probably very similar to the kind of canvas most artists have used throughout history. And you can tell, like you could see the color has kind of got this khaki-like color, like an unbleached titanium. And then you have your Belgian linen, which is much more of like a, a brown, um, kind of a grayish brown. And uh, Belgian linen is has also tends to have a tighter weave, meaning it's a little bit smoother. It's certainly more expensive. Like it's maybe three times the price, maybe double the price of your regular canvas. And generally you have to buy it on its own. Most of the time you can't get it, uh, you know, stretched on anything. Um, but so anyway, long story short, I'm just looking at her painting and I just wondered to myself, is she painting on canvas that has been prepared with some, like a, a brown imprimatur or is she painting on linen? And so, you know, of course I should have looked maybe a little bit more carefully. Well, this says boil on canvas. If it was oil on linen, I'm sure this would literally be where we would see that mentioned. So what that tells me in my little detective work here is that probably they she used a rusty red color for her imprimatura um, in lieu of the yellow. So we could have put kind of a, a, a brownish uh, stain on this Perhaps though, but before we do that, let's just take and continue looking closely at this painting. Ah, come on. So I don't see that same dark color in her face. So that's what, there's two things that could happen is that she might have, it's possible you could stain the entire surface with that brown. And then she might have wiped that away with when she got to the face um, and kind of take, or she what she could have done, and I think maybe even more likely, is taken that brown and then um, just painted, you know, blocks or, or lines with that brown. So let me just see, before I mix that color, Okay, so let's let's do a little bit of like what uh, today's master did. And which one should I start? Let's go to. I'm gonna take. Uh, I'm gonna make a cool brown. I think. Yeah. Okay. So let's. 
Let's take our cool yellow. A little bit of cool red. And a little bit of cool blue. Oops, too much of that. So let's put too much blue in there. It made it go kind of green. So let's just put a bit more red in here. So I'm starting with a cool color because it's very similar to what we would do if we were using our a cool or a warm brown. But since I want to use this in the background, I want to make sure I have a little bit of a cooler color back there. So let's bring these up side by side. So what I think she probably did here is took this. And just kind of quickly painted it in the background. Now you might say, well, yeah, but it looks kind of, it's light blue. Why are we going to put a brown there? Well, I mean, this is what she did. So that's the first, that's the easiest answer. But then the thing is, is she might have been looking, you know, this, this young girl is sitting on the grass. You know, there's obviously some kind of water here. And maybe that's the far shore. And so she might have intended, you know, maybe this is the way it looked. And then as she got the painting done, she might have been like, yeah, you know what? I don't know if I like that big dark stripe across the top of the painting. Ugh. You know what? I think I'm going to change it. So then she probably painted that out later on. That's my hypothesis anyway. It's okay. So now I'm going to take this same color. And let's just do a few lines. You know, as I look at this painting, she's actually painting on a, on a canvas that's got quite a lot of texture in it. So I did make a big deal about how I paint. I like using nice um, canvases that are, have, uh, that are nice and smooth. It looks like the canvas she's painting on was actually fairly textured, kind of a little bit rough. So... If you don't have a, a, a smooth canvas to paint on, well, again, you're in good company. So I'm not going to do all the lines, but I, I think I'm, what I'm going to do is try to leave a little bit of this kind of poking through in a few places. Now you don't need to do this. And so it's possible that she just started this painting and that there's, you know, if they were x-ray it, that there's no pencil lines underneath, that she just sketched this out directly with, um, with uh, this brown paint.
Okay, so I imagine her painting might have looked something like this, except without any yellow. It might have just been the plain white canvas and then this brown over top of it as I've painted it. Um, because I don't think she applied and I'm putting Matura underneath. I could be wrong. I'm, I'm probably mostly wrong. Um, but uh, I, I'm pretty confident that something like this would have appeared on her painting. And again, you know, when we see these things side by side, it's just like, are you kidding me? This looks like so different. Um, but that's again, this is our first little step of the painting. We still got a little bit of uh, a ways to go here. Uh, there's Lisa says, hello everyone, hope everyone's well. Heidi says, hi everyone, I love McNichols works. Deborah posted some last June after visiting the National Gallery. Okay, I did not know that. Christine says, hi guys, I do love Michael and these lessons. Glad I found you in time. Thank you so much, Christine. You're so sweet, I appreciate it. Uh, the very generous uh, comment there. I'm so lucky to be a part of this incredible community. So, um, yeah, I, sometimes I just think to myself, I, this is, I'm just, I must be in heaven. This is amazing. Okay, so let's move on to our next step. Okay, so what we want to do now is paint the background. And I think for our purpose today, the background is going to be, you know, like the, the, <laughs> the, the background, <laughs> the, 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 I guess the sky or the far shore, the water, and probably the grass. And then I'll, for our purpose, use the foreground uh, intertitles that we just saw for the figure with the parasol and the hat, I think, right? Just to kind of keep things tidy here. Although, of course, sometimes I forget to do all that and so it might get all jumbled up, as always. <laughs> so, I'm just gonna take a second here. Rather than even blow drying this, I'm just gonna take my hand and just smudge that paint around. That will speed up the drying time. So, let's once again just take a quick look at this and just think about our colors. So, we're going to be using our cool colors in the background, warm colors in the foreground, as was typical of the time, and as we've done with almost all of our paintings, of course. Um... So let's, I'm, the only thing I'm just wondering to myself, I guess, is at what point do I want to paint that far shore? Do I want to wait a little bit longer to do that before I do, um, and like maybe do that at the end so that we can kind of see maybe what she would see or just paint it? You know what, as I'm just thinking about this painting, like I, I look at the at the background and it looks like it was painted with the water around the same time. I guess it's oil paint, so it's hard to tell. But it wouldn't have surprised me if she painted the foreground first. You know, if you're if you're going uh, on a painting expedition and you've got a model, maybe again this could be her friend, her partner, Dorothea Sharp. Or it could just be um, someone they've hired for the day, or a local schoolgirl, a nanny, or somebody uh, like au pair or something. Uh, maybe another artist that we don't know. Um, you probably want to maximize the time you have them there. So she might, Helen might have started painting the figure and then said, you know, okay, I think you were good. If you need to go and and uh, go home, feel free. I'm just going to stay here and finish the sky. So. Do I want to approach the painting like that, even though it's different than the way I do all of them? And am I just reading into this 
unnecessarily. Let me just sorry. Okay, well, I think what I'm, I'll do, I'm going to paint the water back here. I'll reserve the, the top of the painting until a little bit later. Okay, sorry, I just like to think out loud here. So, let's, uh, let's take our cool, or, so let's take our white. And let's take a little bit of, but we need barely any. Cool blue. Uh, I'm also now going to take I'm going to take some glazing fluid and we're going to use this gl glazing fluid not to glaze um, which is what it's normally for but we're going to use it in order to do to thin the paint out a little bit and so that we can also do a little bit of blending the glazing fluid has a slow dry chemical in it that slows the drying time down and so allows us to paint and blend and mix colors on the canvas. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by kind of applying the paint in this kind of impressionist way, right? Just kind of blotting paint down. Okay, and then I'm going to go to the white. So the goal, you know, with Impressionist painting is not really to mix the perfect color on your palette and then use it. You're often um, taking, mixing the paint directly onto the painting itself. And actually, I'm kind of probably using a brush, maybe too big of a brush for this too. Okay, that might be a little bit brighter than I even want, so let's take a little bit of this blue. And some white again. Okay, I'm going to leave that like that for right now. 
and um, actually I probably didn't need to wash, well, maybe I did want to wash this brush. Because I'm going to go to a smaller brush from now on. So I'm going to try to keep this kind of pace as I paint here. The next thing I want to do is I'm going to start painting her parasol here. And so that's, we're going to take our white and I'm going to put some of this uh, glaze medium in there again. Got a bit of this cool yellow in here. Start with that, and I'm going to take a bit more yellow. Let's maybe zoom in here. And then I'm going to take a bit of that blue. I'm just going to take a little bit of my cool red. blotting out some of these pencil, or pencil lines and or um, lines from the uh, underpainting. Maybe I should let's do use the same color before I move on here for the hat. Oops. 
this. It's too much. So I just took took my cool blue and a little bit of cool red. Together we mix a bit of a purple. Oops, well, it's not bad. It's a little bit intense. On my brush. You know, there's a few places where this cool purple can go. Mostly this is going to turn into a, a warm purple, but it won't, won't hurt to have this bit more of a grayish purple up here. Just drawing my paintbrush off, wiping it off rather than on a rag, on the painting itself to maximize that paint. Why not? Okay. Now let's go to her face. Uh, I'm not even going to bother cleaning my brush. I'm going to now take some bit of cool yellow. A little bit of cool, or, or sorry, warm yellow, warm red, and a little bit of warm blue. Gives me a brown. We add white to it, it's going to become a skin tone, at least a Caucasian skin tone. Once again, I'm going to put a little bit of glazing fluid in there. You could use matte medium or... Um, uh, slow dry medium, both of which I'll just show you here. All right, you got your matte medium, and then your slow dry medium, your glazing fluid. Basically, glazing fluid is these two things combined: matte medium and slow dry medium. All right? Um, slow dry medium is just a chemical that slows the drying time down. Matte medium is just exactly what's in acrylic paint, just without any color in it. So, glazing fluid is well is gonna th is so they they all share very very similar properties. Long story short. I'm just gonna add a little bit more red in there to give it a bit more warmth. Got kind of a peachier skin tone here. So let's zoom back in. It's going to take a bit more. Where's my warm red? Okay.
So the more pink is on, especially her ear. In fact, let's just take even more red. Ears are always got the most red. Cheeks. gonna leave that like that for right now um, I'm now gonna go on to her shirt here so that shirt is mostly white I'm not even gonna clean my brush just keep it kind of a bit dirty with a little bit of my glazing fluid in there I'm gonna take some of my cool colors that I've been using already. And get a little bit of this kind of almost like a bit of a gray. So that's my cool blue and my cool red. Give me this purple. my cool blue coming in. Now I'm going to put some warm colors in here as well. I'm just kind of grounding it with some of these cool shapes. So there's definitely, there's some cool and warm colors appearing in here. Um, let's zoom back out. Okay, I'm just gonna take my brush and just wipe it off 
here in the grass. And now let's do these boots. Archie, let's do her hair. I should have done that earlier. So we can just take her some uh, warm yellow, warm blue, and warm, sorry, warm yellow, warm red, and warm blue. Mix that together, we get a brown. This is on my brush. off. Now let's mix a black. So I'm going to take my um, cool blue, my warm red, mix a deep purple, and then some cool yellow. And we got a black. It's a little bit purpley. Let's take bit more yellow. Cool yellow. So I need to go to a smaller brush here. Okay. Hey. 
Oh, I didn't even do a separate inner title for the for the foreground and background like I was planning on it, but that's okay. Wow, look at all the comments in the chat here. Christine says, I've used orange to underpaint, and I'm very pleased with the result. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of different ways we can go about that. Black Diamond says, you should do some of Metcalf's landscapes. Christine says, well, I just looked him up. Very impressive. Diamond says, are you talking about my post? Christine says, I was. Uh, Metcalf and Innes are my two favorite landscape artists, and William Trost Richards for Seascapes. Sunset Montclair caught my eye. My husband isn't exactly into art, but he likes my stuff when I use bright colors. <laughs> yeah. uh, Black Diamond's gotta go. Uh, booty. Buddy. Buddy. Uh, or that's Kathy, I think, right? Kathy is there. Um. My husband's using the computer for income tax. Uh, we're talking about the National Gallery in DC. Um, if we're talking about me, probably I was referring to the National Gallery in Canada, in Ottawa. Uh, National Gallery in Washington is amazing. I've been there several times great collection you know maybe top certainly top 10 in the world but are certainly top five in in North America huge well series of museums as part of the Smithsonian uh, museums um, okay so let me let's uh, let's Okay, so I've, <laughs> I did do a little bit of, I painted really the our first pass of the foreground on the figure, the girl with the parasol, um, but I'm now just going to go down here into the grass and take care of, start that, and then we're going to go back to the background and then maybe ideally finish the background so that we can come back to where we are and finish the rest of the painting. So... Um, the grass is is going to be is a little bit tricky, so let me just see if I how I'm going to work my brain around that. Uh, oops, that's not on camera. Um, you can see she really worked this up. She really created a lot of texture here. Um. This is going to, uh, how on, it almost looks like she used a palette knife for some of this, to be honest. Some of these kind of scraping qualities. Okay. I mean, this is, you know, when you're looking at stuff by the, great masters it's like oh it's a little intimidating um but um i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to use a smaller brush uh, you could use a palette well i'm going to use a smaller brush which takes maybe more time but it probably is going to create a bit of that scraping quality that we would see that we see in her painting here so what I'll do is let's get uh, warmer colors. Let's do some stuff down there. So I'm gonna take my cool yellow. I'm gonna take cool red. Let's take some cool blue. Because kind of what we're doing is almost a bit of a it's a bit of a fleshy kind of color going on down here. Take some white. And what impressionists often do is, is each brush stroke is a little bit of a different color. So rather than getting all of this nice and neatly colored, I'm just going to start painting with this mess. Now, um, you know, this time, 
I'm going to use some uh, slow dry medium. Because this slow dry medium just really slows the drying time down, which sounds like the obvious. But it's, you know, as I said, the glazing medium also has slow dry medium in it as well, but not nearly as much. This is just pure chemical that slows the drying time down. And the reason why I want to do that is I wanted for the, all of this grass, basically mix it on the palette from here on in. And so I want to be able to have lots of different colors on here that I'm kind of just blending into. So we've got a bit of this kind of purple. This is our cool uh, red and warm blue. Put a bit of white into it. So I'm just going to take a glob of white, mix it into my slow dry medium. So the slow dry medium is also going to kind of give your acrylic paint a little bit of the quality of oil paint. Because oil paint takes forever to dry, you know, somewhere between hours to years, <laughs> depending on the, the brand, pigment, the amount of paint you've applied to the surface, whatever kinds, however much turpentine or odorless mineral spirits or linseed oil, gamsol, gam, you know, that you put in there. Okay. I'm going to take just some of my cool, or sorry, this is my, my warm yellow. The other thing too, if you're not happy with it, you can just wipe it away. Again, I'm going to take another, it's like a big blob of white. Take some more of this, just mix it together.
So I'm making sure I, I go right up to the figure and I paint. I don't want big gaps there where there's like a little halo around things. I want to make sure that I go in there. I basically cover the entire surface. And then if I need to go back and, you know, do stuff with the shoes, I do that afterwards. That's why I started there, and then I'm going to come back to it later on. gob of paint. Notice how the paint is kind of, you know, maybe it's time to zoom in a bit. You know, the, as I'm scooping this paint out, you know, it's kind of gross and it's got lots of different colors in it and uh, it's the kind of thing that might just drive some people crazy. Right. And I'm going to put a bit more slow dry medium in here. Just kind of splattering this paint on here. in you know just sort of here's a little bit of my cool yellow coming into the play I think I'm almost ready to move on from this step here, but it's fun <laughs> just sort of applying paint 
like this, just building up that surface. bit of both yellows here. So I've got my cool yellow and my my warm yellow. I'm going to go to a smaller brush. Actually, even smaller than that. Now, you know what? Maybe I sh Okay, I want to... I don't want to do too much more of this because I still have to go back and work on her body a bit more. There's other colors in here that I want to bring out. There's more purples and browns and everything here. So yeah, you know what? As much as, well, I do want to just do a little bit more. Can I do just a bit more? Is that okay? Just, this is so much fun. A little bit more. I can always put more yellow back on top. I might be putting more texture on mine than the original. Um, but as long as we just keep this between us and nobody rats me out to the paint police, I think I'll be okay, right? Okay, maybe while I'm here, um, what I want to do is I'm just going to use a little bit of a brown. So I take some warm red, bit of warm blue. What I want to do is just draw some of these branches that are here. Um, and I should also, you know, I'm going to go to a different view as well. So what I want to do, I'm just going to, I'm holding the paintbrush now, maybe as almost as far away as possible, right? So that, uh, let me see, I guess maybe that view is not the best. Um, so that I'm just kind of, maybe that's a bit dark, let's get a bit of white. Just, I'm trying to hold the paintbrush almost as lightly as possible. And that's going to help me get more of that branch-like quality.
So I, I'm, I also have my initial sketch just sort of a little bit off uh, out of view here. Um, and I, I'm kind of looking at that thinking, okay, what do I want to do here? I feel like I need a couple of those lines. So this is effective because it gives, you know, it's like, like these branches, twigs, you know, that kind of delicate quality that, that they need. Otherwise, they're going to get too developed. And you know, if I was painting them like this, they're going to be much more dense. And here they're just sort of gliding over the surface. Let's see. I'm going to do the same sort of thing. I'm just going to load this brush up. Because I want to, you know, capture a bit of that chaos of grass that's blowing in a field, right? It's not exactly the way that the original looks, but I'll tell you, that is a lot of fun to paint that way. I gotta have to remember, remember that, which is one of the main reasons that I selfishly do these episodes, because it's really starting, it's really fun to just immerse yourself in someone else's technique, because every once in a while, not every once in a while, pretty much every single time I do these, it's like I see something like, ooh... Keep that in mind. Love the way that looks. That's a fun way to do grass. Because, you know, there's been paintings where I've painted grass from <laughs> dozens of other... And sometimes I'm just like, oh, this is not... It's turning out kind of clumsy, or I'm just not doing it the way that they did. I'm not happy with the way it looks. Um, okay, so I'm not, so also I'm probably not going to use the blow dryer at all for today's painting, um, because they wouldn't have had the blow dryer, you know, impressionist painters are, are first of all, they're outside, <laughs> so unless you have, you know, even today, how would you use a blow dryer if you're standing in the middle of a field, unless you got some kind of generator with you, <laughs> um, and also they're painting with oil paint, right, and so it's going to take time for it to dry. So, oh. 
Okay, so now we've got everything kind of in place. Maybe not, certainly not done, but I'm really happy with where everything is at the moment. Um, now I'm going to go in and start to kind of fine tune things. And now that because I've got paint covering all of the, the entire surface, it gives me a clearer idea of maybe what needs to be done. And as promised, you know, the way that I think anyway, and I, I could be wrong and, and just assume that I'm wrong, but I'm going to humor myself and pretend I'm right. Uh, I, I sort of suspected that this top part here, she might have wanted, you know, it could have been a much darker side to that far side of the river, perhaps, right? And she might have said, well, I'm going to paint that dark. And then as she got to this stage in the painting, having applied that dark with her input amateur, might have said, hmm, I don't know about that anymore. That is really dark. And I know that's the way that far side of the shore looks. Maybe there's a big shadow there, but... Uh, because the way that she sort of painted it is it kind of... That far shore gets very close to the top of the parasol, the umbrella. And then you've got this thing where maybe it looks like it's sort of sitting on top of the umbrella. You know, maybe she probably might have thought, well, you know what? I could drop that line down so it's more clearly behind the parasol and not just clipping the top. But... It might be just easier and compositionally more effective if we lighten it. So I think that's what she did. So let's um, let's do that after a sip of tea. Okay. So I think what she did then is. I think we're going to go back to, and you can see this is still all wet because we put some glazing medium in to, to help it dry. So we're going to take this white, and you can see there's a bunch of different colors in here. And I'm just going to scrape in those different colors so you can see that I don't care if it gets a little bit gross. All right, and mix it into this cool blue. And because there's a bunch of those different colors, it's more likely we're going to get a bit more of a gray. Although I think I do want to put just a bit more blue back in there. In fact, uh, I'm, you know what? I'm just going to take a bit of cool red. I was almost about to put a little bit of warm blue, which would darken it. But then that's a lot of warm color in the farthest part of the painting, which is going to yank it forward. So this, putting that warm, or sorry, the cool red in here, is going to make this a little bit more of a purpley color, which almost simulates a bit of a, a warm blue. And I'm going to try very hard to not apply this too thick. That I want a bit of that brown underneath there to show through. Which is, of course, again, what she did. But also, you know, if I just paint this really, you know, intense, you know, just make it a big solid blob of color back there, then... Um, but then I lose maybe a little bit of the effect that having that brown underneath creates. Because what it does is the light goes, hits, goes right through this top layer of paint, then it hits that brown, then it hits the yellow underneath, then it hits the white, then it comes back up towards our eyes. So that effect, that layering thing that we do with paint is... You know, super effective. Now, let's say I, I went too far. You could always just take a rag and just wipe part of it away. 
Now, I, I was happy with what I had done, but I just wanted to show you that if you felt you had gone too far, let's paint that back. You know, maybe I did need a bit more blue in there. Um, although it's not bad. Hmm. I think I am just going to take a bit more... Well, that's a lot more blue, isn't it? Let's balance it out with a bit more of that yellow. Ooh, it's a bit much. It's radical. Okay, let's just... Okay, not bad. Now I'm going to just, uh, let's take some more blue and white. And I'm not even going to clean my brush. I'm going to keep that. And just now kind of go into here. Oops. Yikes, how did I get Oops, a big blob of paint in there? Little dry medium on here. Just also trying to kind of soften the line between the sky and the water a bit. Or, or the far shore. Maybe it's the sky. I don't, I'm not exactly sure. Okay. And then I'm just going to come into where these branches are. And I was pretty happy with the way I painted it, but she's also kind of obscuring them a little bit to kind of mute them a bit. So we'll follow her lead. put a bit too many branches there, so let's just take a few of these out. Same sort of thing, let's just paint a few out. And not like totally obliterating them out, because they're kind of, it's, it's kind of nice to see a bit of them, but just maybe not making them so present. Okay, while I'm here, now let's go back into our purples from before. This is my my warm blue and my cool red.
I'm trying to like selectively paint now in between the web of little lines that I've got going here. Now let's take a bit of white. So I'm just realizing maybe I have this needs to come down here a little bit if I can now because there's all of this I have paint that's got slow dry medium in it if I start trying to paint into that wet paint that paints gonna mix right not necessarily a bad thing uh, now I could blast it with the blow dryer but I think just for me conceptually the idea of trying to do it while, um, you know, in real time as if I'm standing there next to this great artist in this field makes a lot of sense to me personally. And, you know, while I've got this kind of purple on my brush and it with a, it's got a little bit of white I'm just going to come into the grass Let's get just a bit darker. Let's get a bit more cool red in here. And you know, a bit of yellow. Just a bit of a brown. I'm going to take a bit of the my cool blue. I also want a bit of kind of a brownish green going on in a few places too.
So I wouldn't worry about like overworking this particular area. Now I it, I would I would bet you five bucks she'd be done this painting by now, uh, but that's why she's a master and I'm the apprentice here. So she's working fast and super confident. I mean, more and more I you know I, I think about her I just think like man, it's so tragic you know when when someone like this passes away so early that. Um, who knows what would have happened. Uh, do I want to do more? I think I got the water. Do I? Like this, she sort she puts a bit of this um, blue into the grass, which makes it look like there's a little bit of water that we can see through the grass a bit. Okay, there's definitely more of the grass, but I'm going to wait until we've got more of the rest of the painting completed first. Whew, okay. And there's Sandra says hello. Um, Kathy says, I am working on it like it's Henrietta Shore style. Yeah, Henrietta Shore was another artist I was thinking a lot about while we were getting today's episode ready because Henrietta Shore was also a super successful Canadian artist. Although she really spent so much of her life down in California uh, that um, she was more well known down in California than she was in Canada, uh, whereas Hen um, Helen Nickel spent so much of the, her life, or at least the the last few years of her life, in England in Europe. Um, so you have two, you know, very Canadian for Canadians to leave Canada and make their names elsewhere. Um, but yeah. I, I, that's you could certainly paint, you know. The, when we did the Henrietta Shore, we we deliberately, you know, tried to paint around, um, like our uh, the lines to kind of use the the imprimatura as lines, right? And so kind of creating these like puzzle piece shapes that don't quite m meet 
join up together there's little gaps in between and using those darker colors as lines which is a brilliant and it's also as you may have noticed a pretty hard technique to do all right that's it, it looks really great but it's also time consuming you got to be careful otherwise you one little line you, you kind of erase that border um Sandra says, I love the colors on the hat. Excited to see how it turns out. Mr. De Cabtal says, I'm watching you streaming. Let's go. <laughs> Kathy says, hi, Sandra. Uh, Christine says, it's exciting to watch him build a painting from start. Mixing the colors is most interesting to me. Kathy says, it looks like fun. Um, where's the chaotic comment? I don't know. Uh, oh, it's not chaotic. You have it under control. <laughs> uh, Christine says, sitting there, all calm and pensive, with the almost riotous ground supporting her and the calm, clear water and sky behind her. Doesn't she doesn't look really relaxed but i think she's trying to sort out some inner confusion does that sound right <laughs> it's that's possible um it's also maybe she's trying to stay as focused as possible and not kind of doze off or false you know or itch her face or anything because she's being painted and is trying to be as still as possible which if you've ever tried to be still for five minutes let alone hours at a time it's hard, and it's not like back in the day you could just set up, you know, put a headphone in the ear that can't be seen and listen to a podcast or something. <laughs> You're, you have to be fully present, but keep your eyes open, and you know maybe they're they're talking. You know, it's it's possible that again that this might be Dorothea Sharp, who's posing here, and. Helen McNichols painting her, and then the next day they swap places, and then Sharp is painting McNichol. Um, and so they're good friends, potentially lovers, we don't know, um, but they're, you know, I'm sure they have a lot to say. Again, there's two very similar paintings that were made clearly either on the same day or one after another. So um, maybe that helped keep themselves... Uh, uh, preoccupied so they don't fall asleep because I've I've taught classes where a model has fallen asleep during the class um, and you don't necessarily know until you start hearing the snores happen and then some of the students are like I think he fell asleep I think he fell asleep um, so potentially what you're saying she doesn't really look relaxed Christine is possibly because she's not really relaxed she might be like holding that like fighting the the sleep oh right and kind of dozing off and then helen mcnichols like uh can you oh oh you're you're gonna fall into the river whoa whoa sorry 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 I'm just getting hot out here holding this umbrella like <laughs> <laughs> yeah because he says she won't fall asleep she's got a grasp on that parasol it's a shield of some kind i like this very poetic interpretations christine great um Okay, so now that we've, I'm pretty satisfied with the background, the water, um, and that far shore, or the horizon, the sky, I'm not sure. Let's go in and, um, uh, and complete the rest of the painting. We'll, we'll, we'll do the, uh, what should we do first? I think, let's, I think what I'll do is do the face, and then the, and the arm, arms hands, then her hair, then the parasol, and then her clothes, and somewhere near the end there are the shoes. And the reason why I'm doing it in that order is because they're the things that are, that are being overlapped by other things, and I want the things that are not overlapped, or that are on top of everything, to be done last. So in this instance, the things that are, I mean, I'm, it's it's not never it's never totally clear but let's say you have the face the face is being overlapped by the hair and by the clothes you know the, the arm is overlapping the clothes obviously uh, as well 
but since we probably want to mix the same skin tone and use it for the face and arms, you know, we'll probably do that all at the same time. And then the parasol, of course, is it's um, yes, it's being overlapped by the face, but it's also overlapping the hair. Um, and probably would be satisfying to get the face a little bit further along at this point anyway. So there is a, a method to this madness, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, so let's, let's zoom into that face and take care of that. Um, and maybe just before I do so, let's just uh, mix some colors up again. So to get that skin tone, take our cool yellow, or sorry, cool yellow, warm yellow, warm red and mix that together and we're going to get an orange and then we're going to take a little bit of uh, warm blue we don't need much of it right just a little bit takes that orange and turns it into kind of a sandy brown boom there we go now we're taking some white and mix white into this now right there that's a very pale skin tone, right? Almost a little bit sickly, a little bit too much yellow. So let's put a bit more um, warm red in there. And it's gonna give it a little bit more of a vibrancy, less pale. Now that's, that's not bad. Although, you know, as I'm just doing this, I just took a glance at the original. Let's put these side by side. Her neck is actually probably that bit more of a, a brown, so. Okay, that's as far in as I can zoom, so. I'm just gonna wipe off this excess paint. Come back to this. Let's see, is this gonna be too dark? Not bad, actually. I like how she's used this color or like the shadow on the head there. Now I think I need to be at this point, or at least for the body, using a smaller brush. So I'll do that. And you know what? She's also it looks like she painted it and then maybe even wiped a bit of that off. Mm, I think I wiped too much off, so I'll just put a bit of it back. Just a bit more, well, a bit more brown. Good, so let's try that again. One thing about the painting like this 
because everything's tacky. So when I used to just rest my finger on the painting to paint, I can't because it's uh, sticky everywhere. Take a bit of this color, and a little bit of warm red. Oh, it's so light. I'm just gonna take that, lighten it up a bit, so it's a bit not quite as uh, dark. Added, just took a little bit more warm red into my mixture here. I don't like how yellow her neck is, so I'm going to keep a bit of yellow in this mixture. Hmm.
is tricky. I'm gonna keep on going. She, there's a little bit of blue around her face there. That is pretty smart. Nice little juxtaposition. Let's get a bit of that in there. So I'm taking my cool blue and white. Okay, I'm gonna leave that like that. I know there's still stuff to do, but um, I'm gonna keep on moving. And what might feel like a issue now could be resolved in just a few minutes as I just keep on painting, so. So I'm gonna take some of this brown, mix it into my flesh color just to get a darker color. I keep forgetting that this painting's still wet, so. Um. Man, that, this little hand she's painted is masterful that is wow just gorgeous not easy to do what she's doing right here finger here. What just happened there? Okay, well, we'll just extend this hand down, I guess.
I mean, look how she just uses this little brush stroke. I mean, I, I may have to clean that up, but this is a thumb right there. And just brilliant. So it's a little bit messed <laughs> right now, but I'm, I want to keep on moving. Um, in fact, I think... Yeah, what I want to do next is... Maybe I'm going to paint the shoes next while I'm right here. Okay, so we'll take our um, cool, cool red and warm blue and make a purple. A little bit of white. Let's get our, um, take a little bit of oops, cool yellow, cool blue, any black left, good. Okay, so mostly cool yellow in my black. more black. Let's take some cool blue, cool yellow, warm red. Oh yeah, I was going to take that black and mix it in with my cool yellow. A little bit of white. We did this exact same color. Oh, well, let's just go forward. Okay. 
Okay, now I'm going to take my black. You know what's nice? I see she's put a, a couple dashes of grass that are, are kind of coming up from in between the shoes. Very smart. Very smart. So it helps distinguish between the two. I'll, I'm going to do that a little bit later. I'm not super happy with what I've just done here, but I think it's going to be okay. So, um, what do I want to do? Let's go to the parasol again. Let's do that. There's Lolly. <laughs> Lolly says, I find her hands so difficult that I remember the pain I always had trying to draw a hand for the Michelangelo painting we did. Frustration wasn't even close to what I felt. <laughs> Christine says, rub some dirt on it. It'll be fine. That's uh, that's in a book somewhere. Advice on to an athlete. <laughs> rub some dirt on it. That's a good idea. He says he's keeping the lines of his paint going in the direction of the objects. At first it looks funky and then it works. Interesting. Um, if I understand what you mean, hmm. Uh, what I, yeah, I, I guess if you're, especially with Impressionism, where um, it's, de they're deceptively complex. Like you have to get the paint in just the right place to pull off that simplicity. If you add too much paint, then it just looks kind of muddy and blobby. You know, like I said, just that one little flick of a brush gives that thumb. Now, mine isn't the best example. I still need to do a little work there, but I think it's, it is like, it's like, wow, that little thing and, and the mind goes, oh, that's a thumb. It's just a flick of colored mud. Um, but like, you know, with her clothing, kind of, sh the brush strokes, like, I think Van Gogh is the master at this, of, like, 
using applying brush strokes in following the form to help describe the form right so and we're going to do a little bit more of that's very specifically in the umbrella here next uh, another thing again because this paint everything is there's got either slow dry medium or glazing medium in almost all the paint everything's a little bit tacky so every time i touch it there's you know rather than being bone dry Right, so I kind of made some calculated decisions. Like often when I'm painting, if I'm doing a detail, I'll anchor a finger down and then I can hold my brush over top of it. I don't know if, how visible that is, but like, um, you know, so let's say I'm painting here. I'll often kind of put a finger down and that can help me kind of do a detail so my hand isn't just floating over the surface you know, which can be hard if the paintbrush is floating over the surface. So it's anchored. But that does mean that sometimes not only am I stamping paint all over the place, but I might be peeling paint off of other places. So I made a, a, a conscious choice of like, well, okay, I'm, I ideally don't want to have to do too much more painting in the water. So I'm about to do the parasol. So if I make, so if I need to plant my finger down, that that's kind of a good place. Same sort of thing when I was doing the fingers. I planted my finger down in the middle of her dress by her feet. And when I was painting her shoes, you know, my hand was further away where I could just sort of rest it and kind of lean across there, right? Um, obviously, if you're painting on an easel, then you can do this. But even then, like, artists who are painting on an easel sometimes will use a stick, a baton, they can rest their hand on sometimes if you've ever seen it it looks sort of like a stick with with a sock or something wrapped around and what that is is just a little bit of padding so you're not resting like a uh you know a, a stick which could you know um literally cut the canvas or it could leave an indentation that little bit of a you know it looks like Looks like a stick with like a ball wrapped around the edge, right? So that you can kind of just lean that onto the painting. Uh, be mostly like you would do it kind of like this. And then that way, here, you know, it's not the best example. Another, without that thing there, is you know, I could paint like this by resting my wrist on there, if that's visible. Right, so it's like that. All right, and then that way, at least if you do get so much paint around, it's just a little bit on that end. Okay, um, so parasol time. Um, I like that, parasol time. That sounds like a t-shirt. Okay, uh, so get some more light on this canvas. Just open this. Can't get it open. So I'm going to take some of my white here. Um, yeah, let's take a bit of the slow dry medium, plop that in there. Not to point out the obvious, but you know, when you're using that slow dry medium, it can mean that this painting might be tacky for five, six, hours overnight potentially even so just be kind of mindful of how much you're actually putting in there you can try hitting with the blow dryer afterwards but you might notice it's uh it can get pretty hard to
like how she's put this also right on top, almost using it as an outline. And so this is all about like super subtlety here. So where I need a little bit of red. Let's take a bit of cool red. Where's cool red? Hope I, this is not too much. to be a bit gray. Let's take a bit black. back in here with some yellow.
Okay, let's go on to the blues now. Where's my red here? It's got a bit of cool red in there. Let's get a bit of a gray going on. I'm kind of cheating with a bit of an outline here that she never really did, but... Now because everything's still wet, I can kind of blend them out and play with them and move them around a little bit. Um, so where was that? That color there.
Okay, I think I'm going to move on from the parasol. I mean, I'm close, but I also, you know, I might want to darken her face, and that might change things with the parasol, so let's just, uh, I think while I'm here, I want to just expand her hair a bit. Okay, I'm pretty happy with the, the colors that I've used for her dress. I just need to refine that. So, um, basically what we have here is, is a lot of actually cooler colors than white. So let's just take white. I'll take a tiny bit of uh, black to make a quick gray. I'm just going to put some slow dry medium in here. Like, all of these brush strokes that she's applying are, are so deliberate. Like, it's it's very intimidating because she's got this kind of knack to put the brush stroke exactly where it needs to go. And it's like, oh my goodness, how, how did she know how to paint like that?
I mean, I'm trying to be fairly subtle, and I'm, and it's like, yeah, it's uh, sometimes it's too dark, so then it's too light, and it's too dark. I'm just going to move on down here with her dress. Let's get a bit of actual white in here. That's not totally white, that's still a bit yellowy.
Put one. One, two, three, four. So now I'm just sort of, remember that big line there? I'm just cleaning it up, making it smaller. Making her arm a little bit thinner there, so it's... Oh, the hat. This whole time I've... Okay. I should have been a little bit more aware of that hat. So while I was painting, let's say, the parasol, I could use similar colors, but... Okay, let's take our white. Take a bit of purple.
So that's got a bit more of a cool blue in there, or at least that's what I want to put in there. same yellow that I just applied here do a few little highlights on her clothes Okay, so getting close. Now, I, this is a bit darker than maybe I would have liked. bit more subtle. Some of my lines are pretty dark. Oh, her shirt sleeve too. That was something I was thinking about. Get that kind of stick that she's holding for the parasol. Taking my um, warm yellow and some brown. And I'm just going to draw it back here so that. It's a little crooked, my lines.
face. Hmm. It should go darker. I might glaze that. Let's see, what if I took a bit of my purple doing from further away. So that, I think, I'll let that dry and maybe do another little bit of a glaze on her face again. So many comments here. Uh, there's Jackie says, "Good evening, everyone. I forgot it was Tuesday. Glad I made it." Um, where is My palette is always such a mess. I have no room. Well, you can always get another palette. No problem. Use expanding. I, I know some people like. I, in fact, when I uh, used to paint with oil paint. I had this giant piece of glass that I would use because the great thing with oil paint, you know, when it dries or even before it dries, you can just take like a scraper and just that's how I would just scrape it all off and then use a rag and then you've some Windex and you've got a nice clean surface and you start again. Um, but yeah, I would just expand and then I'd have all these cups and plates and stuff. I do find I'm, I'm <laughs> less. Um, imperialistic with my paint application than I've been in a long time. Probably just for these sh episodes because they, I tend to just easier if I'm a little bit more consolidated, but when I'm painting on my own, I often, I might have like a plate that's just for greens or something, right? But I know what it's like to, to expand and expand and expand. Well, he says, I'm going to have to rewatch tomorrow. It's too late for me. I love the painting, Michael. Another fantastic job. Catch you all again soon. Good night, all. <laughs> Christine says, masters aren't allowed to make it look hard. It's in bad taste. <laughs> I love that. Okay. So, um, I want to... So, there's... A little bit left to do, mostly in the grass, maybe a little bit on her face. I could fiddle with her clothes endlessly, but that kind of defeats a bit of the purpose or the, 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 the best qualities of impressionism is, you know, trying to get that impression. And I think the more and more you work on an impressionist painting, the worse it gets. Right, which kind of you know is maybe the opposite of the way we think about almost everything in Western culture. That the more time you put into something, the better it's going to get. Right, the more love and attention you give it, the better it's going to get. Impressionism is is kind of the opposite. It's like less is better. Right, you're it's always trying to pare it down, get more and more simple, and really trying to avoid overpainting. So even if I'm not super happy with some areas, it's you kind of, it's a little bit of just like, well, you know what, is it, 
Is it so bad that I have to do something to it? Or can I just live with it? Can I just say, okay, it's not the way I wanted, but it's not bad either. And can I just, m we just move forward? So there's the painting as it stands right now. Let's take a look side by side. Uh, I'm gonna go in and put some little bits of, uh, let's just put this right here. It's my cool uh, red. And some white. Again, notice how my palette is kind of getting a little bit uh, full of paint. And my colors kind of start to get a little bit cloudy. Which I like. I like it when the paint you know, it starts to, we get these weird mixtures and I think that's a, a real fun place to be, not something to shy away from, although I understand why it can be kind of stressful. I'm also like where I'm putting these little dots is not necessarily even attached to a branch, which gives it that again, that sense of like, well, maybe I can't like, I'm just looking at it really quickly and I can't see all of the fine details there. So next I want to, I'm gonna start putting back some more grass on top of this. I'm going to try as much as possible to use mostly just um, warm yellow. There's a lot of, I mean, this all this paint still has um, uh, medium in it, uh, slow dry medium, glazing medium. So all of this is still wet. Like if I took my finger, I would just smear all that together. Now, it wouldn't entirely surprise me if she did maybe this step back in her studio. That she might have, once she had the the portrait established, she might have said, okay, that's good, let's uh, pack it up, let's go get some lunch or dinner. And then this is the kind of thing that, you know, might be easier to do in the comfort of your home. Now that might not be something you would tell everybody. Um, I mean, some people would appreciate that. Maybe kind of the an older group of, of uh, artists at the time would be like, okay, okay, well, good thing you didn't paint everything outside. My goodness, you impressionists, like, you gotta do, you know, the best stuff happens in the studio. And then on the other hand, you know, the hardcore impressionists would be like, you did what? You took it back to your studio and you kept working on it? Oh, uh-oh. You know, uh, painting violation. You're supposed to do the whole thing on location. All right? There's a lot of um, competing 
viewpoints here. Because some of the impressions will say, if it's not done on location, then you're cheating. When you go back to your studio and keep working on it, then you're just using your imagination. And the point of this is to be painting what you see. So... Um, but it can be... It, it would be really hard to do this whole thing while you're in the sun and... Let alone the, the fact that the things look different in sunlight. Right? If you're, if you're, you know, just imagine, you know, you're sitting on the beach next time you're on the beach and you're, and just take your sunglasses off and try to read a book for three hours and see what happens to your eyes. See how hard that is to do. And then just imagine what this would have been like for this artist, Helen McNichol, trying to like paint while the sun is just blazing down. Now she might have had um, a parasol of her own attached to her easel, which is you know quite common. Um, but uh, even then, she, there might probably were times where she would take her painting from out underneath the umbrella and just sort of try to check it with with um, the, uh, the, the, you know, with the light as it is. You know, which is similar to like, I did a project almost 10 years ago where I went up to the North Pole. Um, to, not not to, to like Alaska, but twice as far higher than Alaska right to the literal North Pole. I actually went further north than the, the um, geomagnetic North Pole. And I was trying to paint landscapes up there, which is really tricky because <laughs> it's so bright that I had to wear sunglasses. And so try mixing a color wearing sunglasses and then try looking at that color. Um, you know, I mean, it's just it's things look. Unless you're going to make everybody look at your paintings while wearing sunglasses, you're kind of guessing each time you mix a color. Is this really? I don't know. What is ah, so. Um, I think sunglasses existed at this point, but they were pretty rare. And you certainly would not have been walking around town looking all cool wearing your sunglasses. I think people would have been like, you're a space alien if you if you did that. It would look... Um, So you can probably tell like that I'm not looking at the original much at this point. I'm really trying to allow myself to to just or allow the painting to just tell me what it needs and then move forward. I do think mine is well, I was gonna say it looks darker in places and I don't know how much more I really do want to do. I think I'm going to darken her face again with the... Looks like it's almost dry. Um, a lot of this paint is now kind of seized up a bit. 
and I want to keep using that. I like that aspect of the paint where it's So this is warm blue and cold yellow. And I'm trying to kind of now paint around some of the grass. Which is different than the way we've painted some kind of grassy trees and stuff first. Often you want to get all that done um, the background and then put the foreground on top and then move on. Um, artists like Helen McNichol and other impressionist painters, group of seven artists, often painted the sky or in this case like water um, on top of the foreground. So we're painting kind of like background stuff like literally on top of foreground things. I should also say, like, when I'm doing this kind of thing, like, I'm kind of partially zoning out and sort of just looking at the entire painting as a whole all at once, and which makes my eyes go kind of crossed, but I'm sort of just looking at it and then trying to find out, like, what is missing, where are some kind of the, where do some darker colors need to go, um... or lighter colors, whatever it might be at the moment. In this case, this, um, darker colors. So this is just my uh, uh, cool red and warm blue. It's a purple, but you know, as it gets as it's applied here, it gets really, really dark.
So I'm taking my purple again. And some glazing fluid. I think maybe just a bit more. She's a, such a master that, you know, my neck, I'm not so happy with. Let's see if I can tweak that a bit. Okay, I might actually use the hair dryer here just to speed this up.
So I'm still going to darken it. I'm probably not going to go to the same quality of orange that I had on her neck before. I'm, I'm, I might. Let's. I'm going to put on this purple. Purple glaze. Yikes. Actually, it's not bad. Take a little bit of my warm yellow. I just need to blow dry that. It probably just looks exactly the same as it did 20 minutes ago before I started fiddling with that, but... Um, okay, last little finishing touches. Do I want to do anything with these fingers? taking some kind of purple and brown to something a little bit darker and a little bit of the uh, glazing fluid which just makes it a little bit more fluid
Ah, I'm making a bit of a mess of that. Definitely, like the whole shape of that hand is different, right? But uh, it might be okay. <laughs> Good enough to for government work, as my grandfather used to say. Okay, I think I think I can walk away. So. <laughs> Kathy says, Hi again, I'm just catching up at the end. Looks great. I'm a very messy painter too. It usually ends up on my shirt and face. Christine makes a good point. It's a challenging to do an impression of another person's impression. That is very, very uh, well put. Okay, so we're at that time of the episode where we're going to do our side-by-side -side comparison and just see how they turned out, and we'll zoom in, and um, I'm feeling pretty happy. It's not exactly like the original, which is not surprising, and I bet you even if the great Helen, McN Helen McNichol was there uh, trying to paint the same painting again, it would also turn out a little bit differently. And I think that's important to remember, that... You know, it's it's just like if you are typing out an email and then the you accidentally your computer battery just you know drains and then you got to write that email again. You're probably going to write it better the second time around because you've already kind of got your thoughts in order and taken out all the maybe angry personal stuff that you probably is best not to send, right? So uh, anyway, um, let's also uh, just. Um, encourage you to like, subscribe, hit the notification button so you know when future episodes are happening. We're beginning a, a whole month of um, artwork dedicated to Asian Heritage Month next week. Or next week is next week, May already? Oh my goodness. So you want to stick around for that. I've got a whole bunch of incredible artists that, you know, uh, I'm just super excited. It's going to be really, really, really cool. So um, you want to uh, do that so you know when those are happening. Also, if you want to support the channel with a donation as little as a dollar through PayPal or the Super Chat or by contacting me through my email, you can send an e-transfer via email. Uh, my email's on the Facebook page and on my website. Join the Facebook page right now if you haven't already so that you can sub uh, upload your work to the group. And once a month I go through that group and we celebrate your achievements. So... Speaking of achievements, here's my painting for the day. And uh, I think it's okay. 
um, you know, also probably a little bit more saturated than uh, than hers, as I tend to do. I tend to kind of bump up the colors a little bit more, uh, but you know, it doesn't quite have. You know, here I see. I could probably put a little bit more green in here. That's what I see maybe potentially missing. Although, you know what, as I look, you know, at these paintings, you know, let me see if I can. So that's a little bit closer to what mine looks like. I always, I have the brightness up a little bit higher. So it uh, it makes just so you can see the details and the darkness a little bit easier. But um, yeah, I'm sure as time goes on, even later tonight as I look at it, I'll feel happier and happier with it. Um, so let's zoom in here, or maybe let's just make sure that's in focus. And where should we start? Yeah, you can really see how much more saturated my colors are. Um, so just sort of looking at that hat. Uh, I did put... It's almost... It's verging a little bit on the Easter egg kind of colors. Pinks and purples. Pastel pinks and pastel purples. And pastel yellows. And pastel uh, yellow... What did I... Did I say yellow already? Oranges. <laughs> Uh, a little bit of almost pastel green, so it's that's one thing with this painting. It, it could easily flip over into the Easter egg kind of color palette, um, which maybe this is a great one for Easter next time. Um, the grass, I actually think, turned out pretty good. That was also a lot of fun to apply the paint in that really aggressive way. So... Um, over the other side of the painting. Uh, I just noticed something on her dress. I just want to touch up real quick. I planted my finger in the middle of the painting in order to paint other things and Anyway, couldn't see it, doesn't matter. One thing I kind of liked about hers, and I I guess I got a bit of it just intuitively with these, is I liked how there's almost like this bowl-shaped um, uh, area here around the grass that appears to kind of, I don't know, frame her, her body. Uh, I'm actually pleased with these shoes when I was painting them I wasn't too happy with the way they were turning out but you know when I kind of step back a little bit it's like oh okay actually that that works it's fine that's, that's good um, let's go up here and look at that. again my colors are you know maybe 20% or 10, depending on where you are, 20% more saturated than the original. Um, I think we've got this area up here, like the, the colors are pretty close, so I'm happy with that. And you know, just all these little bits of, you know, trying to kind of give that effect of light coming through in between the grass. Let's just go all the way to the other side. Just noticed now let's well, let's go right to her uh, I just noticed like how much more curved that back part of the parasol on her painting is in mine I don't know how I missed that do I don't want to do any little do I want to do I need to should I
Okay, so I <laughs> know I just fiddle with this forever. Um, let's look at the subject of the painting. They different, totally have different expressions too. Like in the, in hers, she she looks kind of sad. The the girl under the parasol. Mine has maybe a bit more of. She almost looks like she's clenching her teeth a little bit. The way that her how round her jaw is as opposed as opposed to how much more pointy uh, Helen McNichols version is. Oh, great! I just saw a mouse run by. Awesome. Um. Yeah. You know, again, the, her hands are a little bit different than the original, but I don't mind. I don't mind how this painting turned out. So let's just zoom out one more time here. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you so much for painting along. Once again, another painting in the the in the can. Doesn't sound very good, does it? Uh, we'll see you guys. I think next week. It might be the next time we we meet. So, until then, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, morning evening, sunset, sunrise, wherever you happen to be on our beautiful planet Earth. You're doing the a world a favor by making art, so keep on going. Can't wait to see you again. Have a great night, everybody. Goodbye.